ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನಧಿಮಂದ್ಞಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಖಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮುಧಿಥೇನ ತಸ್ಮೀಗುರುವೆ ನಮ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಾಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ನಾರಾಯಣ ನಮಸ್ಕೃತ ನರಂ ಚೈವ ನರೋತ್ತಮ ದೇವಿ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ವ್ಯಾಸ reading from the Shri Mad Bhagavatam canto 7 chapter 8 text 9 jahi just give up asram demoniac bhavam tendency imam this tom you my dear father atmanah of yourself samam equal manah the mind tatsva make na not santi or vidvashah enemies rutte except ajitahat uncontrolled atmanah the mind utpate on the mistaken path of undesirable tendencies Sitat, being situated. Tathi, that mentality. He, indeed, anantasya, of the unlimited Lord. Mahat, the best. Samarhanam, method of worship. Translation, Prahlad Maharaj continued, My dear father, please give up your demoniac mentality. Do not discriminate in your heart between enemies and friends. Make your mind equipoise toward everyone. Except for the uncontrolled and misguided mind, there is no enemy within this world. When one sees everyone on the platform of equality, one then comes to the position of worshiping the Lord perfectly. Purport is by and grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Unless one is able to fix the mind at the lotus feet of the Lord, the mind is impossible to control. As Arjuna says in Bhagavad Gita 6.4, Chanchalam himana krishna pramati bhalavadradham tasyaham nigraham manye vayor iva sudushkaram For the mind is restless, turbulent, obstinate, and very strong, O Krishna. And to subdue it, it seems to me, more dif- is more difficult than controlling the wind. For the mind is restless, turbulent, obstinate, and very strong, O Krishna. And to subdue it, it seems to me, is more difficult than controlling the wind. The only bona fide process for controlling the mind is to fix the mind by service to the Lord. We create enemies and friends according to the dictation of the mind. But actually there are no enemies and friends. Pandita samadarshinaha. Samak sarveshu bhute shu madhaktim labate puram. To understand this is the preliminary condition for entering into the kingdom of devotional service. Shahyasuram bhavam imam tomatmana samam mano tatsvana santi vidvashah ritirajita rahmana upate stita tadhi hyadan tasyamat samaranam. Prahlad Maharaj continued, My dear father, Please give up your demoniac mentality. Do not discriminate in your heart between enemies and friends. Make your mind equipoised toward everyone. Except for the uncontrolled and misguided mind, there is no enemy in this world. When one sees everything on the platform of equality, that one then comes to the position of worshipping the Lord perfectly. If it wasn't for the uncontrolled mind, we wouldn't have any problems in this world. Krishna tells Uddhava in the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam, it's because of the mind that one's been in the material world since the time immemorial, accepting one material body after another. He says that the mind has fearsome, God-like powers over the soul. 
And in that instruction, and to back it up, he then tells the story of the Avanti Brahmana, who loses everything in life and then takes off on his own as a renunciate, and then is harassed by everyone he meets. But he doesn't take it personally. He says, if you bite your own tongue, who can you blame? Because you're the one who bit it. So this verse has always been a stark realization that there's no one else to blame. One's responsible for one's own mind. This is the implication of Krishna giving so much instruction about the mind that one must bring the mind under control. He says if it's unbridled, then self-realization will be very difficult work. And therefore, because Krishna says it, it's possible. This is the logic given by Srila Vyasadeva in the Vedanta Sutra that the living entity is an agent for change. Because the Shastra says so, and because the Shastra is speaking to us, therefore, it's altogether possible. And sometimes the question comes up, how is it possible? This comes in the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, 13th chapter, when some sages were inquiring about how one could ever get free from the influence of the mind in this material world. And they asked Lord Brahma. And Lord Brahma uh, prayed for assistance and received the darshan along with the sages of the Hamsa Avatar. And the sages headed by Sanaka approached the Hamsa Avatar and asked, Who are you? And he says, Hamsa Avatar replied, That's, How do you mean that? If you're considering that I'm an ordinary conditioned soul, then what's the use of asking me who I am? Also, if you consider that my body is ordinary, that it's made of five elements, then you should have asked, who are you five, not who are you? He goes on to explain to them as a preamble that one should preliminarily understand that one is not the body when making an endeavor for spiritual life. And then Hamsa Avatar explains how we're entangled in the material world because the mind is embedded within the objects of the senses within the world. And the objects of the senses flow into the mind. This is how the material universe is set up. As mentioned in the first canto, second chapter of Bhagavatam, that in the beginning of creation, the Lord created the subtle mind for the living entities to allow them to interface with the sense objects. And quite strikingly, Hamsa Avatar mentions how they're inextricably connected. The sense objects automatically flow into the mind, and the mind automatically goes to the sense objects in this world. In fact, Kapiladev tells how a living entity, when taking shelter in the womb of a woman, begins to develop. The consciousness doesn't develop until seven months. And at the time of seven months, the soul becomes aware of the fact that he's entangled in the material body again. And then he begins to repent and lament that he's in this situation. And he prays to the Lord. If he's fortunate, Kapiladev says he remembers a hundred births that he's already taken. Then he's automatically pushed out of the birth channel by the powerful heirs. And when he comes out into the world, he forgets that he had been praying to the Lord because the senses immediately become externalized and they connect with their objects. Then he becomes surrounded by his so-called relatives who make a little name tag and then slap it on him and say, 
here's your new name. Your name is Schnicky. <laughs> and so Hans Avatar says, one has to become fully aware of the futility of the engagement between the mind and the senses, and the senses and the mind. Krishna also gives a general statement about this in the 11th canto, when he says, Shuti Pratyaksham Aitiyam Anumanam Chatushparam Pramani Shwananasta Anad Vikalpat Savirajite that you should use four kinds of evidence to find out for yourself that this material world is unstable and that you're not part of it. That is Shruti, hearing from the Shastra. Pratyaksha, you should see for yourself. Anuman, make logical deduction. And Aitiyam, which traditional wisdom which is passed down. Anavastana means that it's not a stable situation that, that one's in. Vikalpatsavirajate. Therefore, one should renounce the material world altogether. And that's what's being recommended here. Only Hans Avatar goes on to explain that it's not possible to give up the senses altogether because they're eternally active, because the living entity has eternal senses. Krishna confirms in the Bhagavad Gita, Nahikashitshanamapi Jatu Tishchatya Karma Krit Karyate Havasha Karma Sarva Prakriti Jayagunai. We are eternally active. However, uh, he says that, as does this purport, one must learn that everything that one sees within the world is connected to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and therefore engage it in his service. He explains also that the various states of consciousness we experience in this world are illusory. And he gives three stages of consciousness. One is wakefulness. This is caused by the mode of goodness. And then there's sleep with dreams. This is caused by the mode of passion. And then there's sleep with no dreams. This is caused by the mode of ignorance. But he says one should know that the living entity exists beyond these three states and that the living entity should become aware of these three states and therefore see himself as separate from them. The living entity, he says, should become Sakshitvena. Sakshitvena means that he should become a witness and see that he's moving through this world, moving through different states of consciousness. But actually, as the Vedas say, asango khyayam purushaha, he has nothing to do with him, no actual connection. So in this sense, the mind is also just like a movie screen. And Yoga Sutra explains, because of my connection with the three modes of material nature, one life after another, I accumulate vrittis or impressions which then are projected onto the screen of the mind and then I identify with that movie just like if you go to a movie a really good Bollywood movie it's very absorbing then the lights go off and the movie the screen comes on and then uh, you're carried away with great happiness to see all the dancing that takes place right and one also might begin to cry when the hero of the story dies and falls off a cliff and smashes his head. And then, oh. But actually, this is only watching light on a screen. So similarly, we're observing the mind. And not only that, the mind and my interaction with it is highly interpretive. There are three states of mind. The first is perception. Is that mind is an instrument for perceiving the world. And we actually don't perceive the objects in the world unless we become focused on them. Just like if you're reading a book and you're on a paragraph and then you're thinking about the fact that you forgot to email your best friend who emailed you last week and that he's going to be very angry at you. And you get to the bottom of the paragraph and you realize my eyes were in contact, running down. But they, 
there was no perception. There was no understanding of what I read. So therefore, the senses have to be focused on their object in order to perceive them. Once I perceive the objects of the world, then there's a matter of interpretation. The mind interprets. And Krishna explains in the 17th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita that the mind becomes conditioned by various modes of nature and therefore I interpret it in different ways. What I see. I interpret what I see in various ways. So it's not that we're... La Epictetus, a Greek philosopher, said we don't see the world the way it is, we see the world the way we are. And we interpret it in a certain way. Then interestingly enough, the way we interpret it then gets signaled to my physical body. For instance, if you see your friend walking down the courtyard and he averts his eyes and keeps walking, you might think, oh, he hates me. Might you not think that? Say yes. So say you see your friend, he looks away, and then you think, oh, he hates me. And then uh, suddenly you become filled with emotion. What emotion? Shastrakrit? Anger. A little angry, a little morose, and uh, the mind begins to spin, and then the body changes. And then I perceive that my body's changed, so then I think, oh, it must be a fact, because the body's going through changes. Just like if you put your shoes outside, and you go out, and you find that they're not there anymore. You might say, someone just stole my shoes. How do you feel? Angry, distressed, start thinking, why are people like this in the world? And then someone says, no, they're right over there. And then how do you feel? kind of stupid and then you might <laughs> feel uh, you feel okay so the mind the body have this connection through which I'm interpreting my environment according to the way my mind has been become uh, developed under its uh, association with three modes of material nature and there's a, a loop and a cycle through which I interpret and then my body goes through changes and then I reinterpret and think oh this must be true and I become bound in a bodily conception of life. So, Krishna says in the form of Hamsa that one should become free from this by seeing oneself as separate from this process uh, of the mind. And this is, uh, to achieve this, one must have a master. The mind has to have a master. The mind also has to have a goal. And it also has to have a schedule these three things. It has to have a master, a goal, and a schedule. Or, I was thinking MSG, a master, a schedule, and a goal. It's easier to remember. Of course, MSG is not, it's, a, it's not used very much anymore. So, if we have a, if, if we accept a higher authority, and prob that uh, my mind is not reliable, it needs to be under control of a, of a master. And one can uh, understand through uh, good reasoning that there are higher authorities. This is Jiva Goswami's uh, argument in the Tattva Sandarbha that one should accept the ultimate authority of the Shastra. And he explains why. Because all other, he eliminates all other forms of evidence as being reliable. And therefore, if one could take shelter of Shastra and say this is axiomatic truth and follow it, and then take up with a person who is expert in following and explaining the Shastra, kind of like a spiritual attorney who is well versed and can explain all the different aspects so that one can follow it. This is the beginning of bhakti actually. It's, it's a Tao Shraddha. And Rupa Goswami explains that this Shraddha means faith in Shastra. So you have to accept the, the Shastra with faith. And then from there, uh, one should have a goal. The devotional service should be, and the practice should be goal-oriented. Sankhya Purvaka Namagana Nativi Kalava Sani Krito. 
Srinivasacharya explains how the six Goswamis of Vrindavan had a measured way of practicing devotional service. Every day they counted how much they did because the mind's very tricky. You may say, I did enough, the mind would say, I did enough yesterday, today I won't do anything, and then ten years later you're still not doing anything. <laughs> so one has to regulate uh, the mind by having a, a clear goal and, and keeping on a schedule, uh, having a, a regulation for the mind. And Krishna recommends this in the Bhagavad Gita, that you can control the mind by keeping it on a tight schedule moving from uh, one shastrically approved item to the next tat tat karma pravartana there are various activities that one can perform also uh, the activity of uh, going out into the world and teaching krishna consciousness to others is an excellent way to observe one's own mind and the minds of others because as uh, for instance if if you go out for book distribution which is a way in which you'll meet uh, many individuals and you'll be able to observe their various states of mind and you'll be able to observe your states of mind in relationship with theirs you can see people um, for instance when we go out to distribute books oh something when I was just in Pune, we were in Pune, we had a monthly Sankirtan festival where uh, we all went out together, about 80 devotees, to distribute books on MG Road and other places. So I was experimenting because this is a great experiment in consciousness to go out and meet people and introduce them to the Shastra. And so I was saying to people, uh, I said, uh, you look spiritual. And I'd stop them, I'd say, I'm from California, where are you from? They'd say, I'm from uh, here in Pune. And I'd say, I love Pune, great. And I'd hand them a book, I'd say, here, please uh, take a look at this. This is for you, from America to, to uh, Maharashtra. <laughs> and then, uh, I, then I, would, I would tell them that they, they look spiritual. And it's interesting how the mind reacts to that, people's mind reacts. If you've ever had the experience, if you walk out of your ashram and someone comes up to you and says, you look tired, how do you feel? You start, you're like, yeah, maybe, I'm, maybe I am tired. As somebody comes up and goes, you really look terrible, how do you feel? You were feeling all right, but then all of a sudden they say, you look terrible, then you start to feel terrible. And what I found in this experiment, going around to meet people in various parts of the world, I say, you look spiritual. And suddenly, uh, there's a bypass to the mind because the fact is they are spiritual and suddenly they think oh yeah I'm spiritual and then I ask them this question what's your secret and uh, then you'll notice that people have a secret according to the mode of nature they're in oftentimes in very uh, rowdy areas where people are carousing they say what's your secret and they go oh, 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 oh I drink a lot of whiskey or I smoke ganja and they uh, relate to that as being a means through which they're spiritual and other people in the mode of passion that was ignorance in case I didn't mention and then in the mode of passion people may say something like oh I uh, I work hard and I live a good clean life and then in the mode of uh, goodness they might say something like Oh yes, I know all about this, I practice yoga. And you can, you can see that there are gradations of minds and our interaction with them just by presenting the same information to each person and interacting with them. And you can also see the way in which the mind accepts and rejects and how it can change. I call this the mantra effect because in Lord Ramachandra's pastimes, Taikei was perfectly happy to have Lord Ramachandra installed on the throne until Mantra started needling her and saying this isn't a good idea and then within hours she completely reversed her position as if has it ever happened to you that you changed your mind about something due to outside influence say yes thank you 
it's not only possible, it happens all the time because the living entity is tatasta and open to suggestion and the influence of the environment. So, uh, one can take up the process of Krishna consciousness by eliminating the uh, dependence on the material world. A categorically, under, understanding categorically that it is not beneficial to interact with the sense objects uh, for, for anything outside of uh, my service, which is regulated by the Shastra and the Guru. And then one may uh, make some goal in Krishna consciousness. This is extremely stimulating, very practical. If you take time to write down your devotional goals, then uh, your mind will immediately start to pursue them. And then, in order to accommodate that pursuit, you may then make a schedule and stay on your schedule. It's like if you decide to chant 64 rounds today and you write it down, you make that your goal, then your schedule for the day will change. Do any of you have a schedule today? One, two, three people. Okay, there's room for scheduling. Um, your, your schedule might change. You may take the long route around so you don't have to talk to anybody to finish your 64 rounds. Because you know if I walk through the assembly, I'll be stopped three or four times and, and I'll use up half an hour. So our, our life can adjust accordingly. So these are three practical things. So uh, now we'll take some reflections because we have 12 minutes left. And we'll, you just reflect back anything that you heard so far and we'll try to uh, dis discuss it more. And Nagar Kirtan looks like he's ready to go. I like that quote you gave about that philosophy. He said that um, it's, it's, we don't see the world as it is, we see it as we are. Yeah. And people interpret things uh, variously, even though they're standing in the same place. Yes, Prabhu? In the purple, what Prabhu says that we have no, we have no friends, or, or Hamsa. Hamsa said we have no friends or no enemies, yet still we, we have friends. We, we, we don't walk around in a neutral state like that. When we have associations and friends that we're not supposed to. So, so, so what about it? Yes, yeah, so that okay? Yeah. Uh, as, as is mentioned, this, there's a way in which uh, all of the ways that we interact with the world must be connected to the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And there's ample instruction in the Shastra about how to interact with various kinds of people in the world. <coughs> for instance, for instance, for uh, Advanced devotees, Ishvare Taradi Neshu, Bali Sheshu Dvisatsucha, Prema Maitri Kripopeksha, Yakaroti Samadhyamaha. Madhyamaha Adhikari sees the Supreme Lord and cultivates love and sees and understands who are devotees and cultivates appropriate friendships, sees the innocent and tries to pour in as much mercy as possible and then also uh, sees those who are envious and uh, avoids them. So just that instruction in and of itself is, is, is enough of a, a guide to uh, help us move throughout the world in, in a proper way. And then there's more specific instructions about association with devotees. For instance, in the Upadeshamrita, Krishneti yasya giritam manasaya drieta dikshasi che pranditi bhishta bhajantamisha shushushaya bhajana vigna mananya mandya nindani shunya hrdimipsita sangalabhya For those the people you see that say Hare Krishna then in your mind you offer obeisances you just appreciate that there's a wonder here that this person was able to utter the name of the Lord and then for those who have uh, evolved spiritually and come to make a vow to uh, chant Hare Krishna under initiation. Those people you can take the trouble to bow down to. And then those who have become advanced by the process, one should 
hang around outside their door, try to get an appointment, you know, get some instruction, and so forth. And so there are various ways in which uh, the, the Shastra is meticulous about explaining how we can interact with the world in the context of Krishna consciousness. The other day, Nagarkirtan lost his phone while he was taking a shower in the Brahmachari ashram. And then, uh, you know, of course we didn't speculate very much, but one could have, like, how could this have happened and so forth. But it turned out a monkey took it, reached in and took it out of the window. Man was riding on a train, and then he saw a beautiful woman get on the train. And the train was getting more and more crowded, and he took a fancy to this woman. His mind was attracted. So they went into a tunnel and the lights went out. And then people were jostling in the train and he felt some was bumping up against his arm. He thought, that's the attractive woman. I saw how she was moving this way when the lights went out and now she's closer. And then in his mind he thought, well, maybe she likes me. You know, she knew I was over here. So she probably moved over. And then he thought, we might get married. And, you know, my parents are going to be really proud because, you know, they always told me I was a loser and I'd never met, meet anybody and look, there she is right there. I'm going to get a house. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to get a house. We're going to live in that house. We're going to have the best kids. And all of a sudden, they burst out of the tunnel. The light comes in and it's an old decrepit man bumping up against him. Oh! And he jumps. And the, the whole existence of, of my happiness and distress in the material world it happens on this kind of basis. It's an illusory impression created by the conditioning of my mind and I'm interpreting the environment constantly like this. However, uh, one is advised to be equipoised and see that everything is going on in a uniform way in the material world. Even one shouldn't criticize or blame others because one can see that the universe works uniformly by the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And one should interact with people in a, in a way that is um, favorable to one's uh, Krishna consciousness without making enemies. Yes, Prabhu. Yes, the, the, we become, the mind becomes conditioned and therefore by default I act in various ways. However, this process is reversible and the prescription is, as I mentioned, one should have a master, one should have a goal, and one should have a schedule. And one of the goals is to hear about Krishna. Uh, Devahuti asked Kapila Dev, how is it possible to become free from the influence of the mind? Because since the time immemorial, I have considered, and even now I consider, that I am my body. And I don't see the separation between myself and the body. How can I become free from that? Kapila Dev answers that one should hear for a long time. And then he comments that the subtle body of the living entity becomes dissolved by the process of devotional service in the same way that food, when it goes into the stomach, dissolves and is distributed to the various parts of the body, even without one's knowledge. So one should go on hearing and also practice the etiquette of uh, spiritual life by interacting with various entities in a proper way. And then one, one can retrain the mind to become spiritual.
that Krishna, when instructing uh, the sages, that one should cultivate the mode of goodness in all of one's activities. He even mentions details that you should drink clean water, you should live in a clean environment. And by uh, rising from the modes of ignorance, uh, through the mode of passion, to the mode of, of goodness, one can... the mind is to think how to do good for others. And uh, if you have that, also, I, I read once in a book, how to, how to Stop Worrying and Start Living. It's a, it should be on the um, nightstand of every temple president. It's written by Dale Carnegie. And he says in there, when, you, when you're fully absorbed in anxiety because of some personal situation in your life, the way to come out of it is to think of how to serve somebody else. It takes you out of your own limited little universe of the mind where you think everything's so important. And so Krishna consciousness, Jive Doi Krishna Nam Sarvatanamasa. This is our mission statement. Think how to do how to give mercy to the Jivas. If you think about that 24 hours a day, your devotional practices will be fully effective. And if you don't, then they become niyamagraha and boring and, and then uh, your mind will be distracted to materialistic activities. Thank you very much. All glories to Srimad Bhagavatam, all glories to all the assembled devotees, Srimad Prabhupada Ki Jai. Natchari Armarman, Natchari Armarman, Natchari Armarman, Natchari Armarman, Hey! Natchari Armarman, Natchari Armarman, Natchari Armarman, Natchari Armarman.